Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. Today, I am finally able to show you how the Radeon RX 6800 XT performs. And I've also got the standard 6800 on hand as well. So there will be a dedicated review of this model on the channel shortly. There is a lot to cover, so I wanted to give each of them their own dedicated review. For those of you who may have been living under a rock for the past few weeks, the 6800 XT is AMD's new high-end gaming graphics card targeting the GeForce RTX 3080. Basically, AMD is claiming 3080 Lite performance for a $50 discount while offering considerably more VRAM at 16 gigabytes versus just 10 gigabytes for the GeForce card. I'm not gonna pour over all the specs again as we covered that in our announcement video. In short, the 6800 XT is set to come in at $650 US. It's based on the new RDNA 2 architecture using TSMC 7 nanometer process. It packs 4,608 cores, 288 TMUs, and 128 ROPs across 72 CUs. The cores clock it up to 2,250 megahertz, and then we have 16 gigabytes of 16 gigabits per second GDDR6 memory on a 256-bit wide memory bus, allowing for 512 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. The card's rated at 300 watts for the total board power, and of course it supports PCI Express 4.0. There's some new features here as well, such as ray tracing support, 128 megabytes of AMD Infinity Cache, and shared access memory. AMD also has a new reference card design, which looks significantly better than anything we've seen from them before. So without wasting any time, let's talk about the test system and then jump into the blue bar graphs, as I know that's what most of you are here for. Once again, I'll be testing with my Ryzen 9 3950X test system. And yes, I will be updating to the 5950X as soon as I can. Updating all of this data will take a solid two to three weeks of nothing but testing. So it's not gonna happen overnight, but it is something I'll be working on as soon as I can, basically once I get through all these new products. It is worth noting though that the 3950X has very little influence on the 1440p data and it doesn't limit the 4K results in any way. So for the most part, very little will change by moving to the 5950X anyway. Okay, let's get into the results. Starting with Godfall at 1440p, we find very strong performance from the 6800 XT. Here it beat the RTX 3080 by a 14% margin and coming right behind the 3090. Then when compared to the 5700 XT, we're talking about a 92% increase in frame rate going from 52 FPS right up to 100 FPS. So that's a pretty incredible jump right there. Of course, the 6800 XT is a much more expensive product, but the 5700 XT was considered to be AMD's flagship gaming GPU from the previous generation. Jumping up to 4K does see the 6800 XT lose some ground to the 3090, though even here it still managed to match the RTX 3080, so not bad given that it is slightly cheaper. We are also looking at 60 FPS performance at 4K in what is a very visually impressive title. Whereas Godfall is an AMD sponsored title, Watch Dogs Legion is an Nvidia sponsored title, but even so the Radeon RX 6800 XT still impressed at 1440p, matching the RTX 3080 with 85 FPS on average, using the highest visual quality settings the game has to offer. That said, at 4K we are seeing performance slip a little bit, or rather the 3080 scales better at high resolutions. The 6800 XT actually scales as expected and is in line with the 2080 Ti, for example. Anyway, the end result being an 11% loss to the 3080 at 4K, placing the 6800 XT between the 3080 and 3070. The 6800 XT performs exceptionally well in Assassin's Creed Valhalla, beating even the 3090 by a rather convincing 14% margin at 1440p. It is possible Nvidia will improve performance in this title with future driver updates, but for now AMD enjoys a serious performance advantage. That said, the Ampere GPUs are able to catch up at 4K, and now the 6800 XT finds itself situated between the RTX 3080 and 3090, which is still a mighty impressive result, it's just less impressive than what was seen at 1440p. Dirt 5 is another new AMD sponsored title, and here the Radeon GPUs really do clean up. The 6800 XT was 18% faster than the 3090, and 30% faster than the 3080. That is a staggering difference, and I expect at some point Nvidia will be able to make up some of that difference with a future driver. How long that'll take though, it is hard to say. It did take them quite some time before they addressed the lower than expected performance in Forza Horizon 4, for example. Moving to 4K though, we again find a situation where the Ampere GPUs kick into gear, and here they manage to make up quite a bit of ground on the 6800 XT. Even so, the RDNA 2 GPU was still 5% faster than the 3090, and 16% faster than the 3080. 
Next up, we have Death Stranding, and again, we're seeing some very impressive results out of the 6800 XT at 1440p. Here, it's able to match the 3090, nudging it ever so slightly ahead of the 3080. Even at 4K, the performance is still very good, and although the 6800 XT does slip behind the RTX 3080, we're only looking at a 5% deficit, and with over 100 FPS on average, I doubt anyone is going to complain with that kind of performance at 4K. The Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 results at 1440p are quite good. Here we're looking at an almost 60% performance improvement over the 5700 XT, averaging 51 FPS, which more crucially placed it on par with the RTX 3080. However, once again, we're seeing a situation where at 4K performance does slide quite considerably, and now the 6800 XT is 18% slower than the 3080. Still, when compared to the 5700 XT, it is 74% faster, and that's obviously a serious performance improvement. Moving on to Shadow of the Tomb Raider, here the 6800 XT trailed the RTX 3080 by a few frames at 1440p, though we're basically talking about the same level of performance, as there's no chance you're going to notice the difference between 151 and 154 FPS. Again though, we're seeing the 6800 XT fall short at 4K, this time trailing the RTX 3080 by an 8% margin. Not a huge difference, and 79 FPS on average at 4K is still very impressive in this title. Frame rates in Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege are very competitive, as the 6800 XT offered RTX 3080 Lite performance, nudging ahead by 3% at 1440p to pump out 337 FPS on average. The 6800 XT also remained strong at 4K. Here it was capable of rendering 168 FPS on average, making it just 3% slower than the RTX 3080. So in other words, the same level of performance. The F1 2020 results are also massively impressive as here the 6800 XT is once again seen delivering RTX 3080 Lite performance and with 197 FPS on average, it was 55% faster than the 5700 XT at 1440p. Increasing the resolution of 4K saw the 6800 XT beat the older 5700 XT by a whopping 72% margin. Though despite that increase, it was a little slower than the RTX 3080. But still, overall a great result, and I'd argue that 120 plus FPS at 4K in F1 2020 is plenty. Moving on to the Gears 5 testing, and here we're again seeing very strong 1440p performance from the 6800 XT as it managed to edge out even the RTX 3090. Though we will be running into a bit of a CPU bottleneck here with the Ryzen 9 3950X, and yes, when I get a bit more time, I will spend over a week updating the data with the 5950X. Again, we're seeing the 6800 XT slip at 4K, or rather more accurately, the higher core count Ampere GPUs come to life at 4K. Either way though, the end result being a 12% performance deficit in favour of the RTX 3080. Horizon Zero Dawn ran very well on the 6800 XT at 1440p, again delivering RTX 3080 Lite performance, which just two months ago now was the kind of performance that really blew our minds. We do see the 6800 XT fall behind the RTX 3080 by a 10% margin at 4K, so it's less impressive relative to the GeForce competition at this extreme resolution, but even so we're talking about an almost 80% improvement over the 5700 XT. The Assassin's Creed Odyssey results are quite different to those seen in the newer Valhalla title. Interestingly, at 1440p, the 6800 XT is rendering fewer frames per second in Odyssey, whereas the Ampere GPUs are rendering more. As a result, the 6800 XT was 5% slower at 1440p when compared to the RTX 3080, and just 29% faster than the 5700 XT. Then we see, quite unexpectedly, that the 6800 XT manages to overtake the 3080 at 4K. So scaling here is at odds with everything that we've seen previously. Now the 6800 XT is 5% faster than the 3080 and 71% faster than the 5700 XT. Next up we have World War Z and here the 6800 XT finds itself situated between the 3090 and 3080 at 1440p, beating the latter by a 9% margin with 207 FPS on average. Here we have yet another example at 4K where the 6800 XT is able to pull further ahead of the 3080, this time beating it by a 14% margin to come in just behind the RTX 3090, so a very impressive result there. Unfortunately, we are running into a slight CPU bottleneck in Metro Exodus at 1440p with these higher end GPUs, and again, while I do plan to swap to the 5950X as soon as I can, that testing will require a lot of time. The 4K data though is in no way CPU limited, and here the 6800 XT does fall behind the 3080 by a 15% margin, which is quite a substantial difference, though 105 FPS on average at 4K is still quite impressive. 
Testing with Resident Evil 3 shows the 6800 XT trailing the RTX 3080 by a 3% margin at 1440p, so we're basically receiving the same level of performance. That's a pretty incredible 92% performance uplift over the 5700 XT and a 27% boost over Nvidia's previous generation flagship part, the 2080 Ti. Then at 4K, the 6800 XT is 6% 6 slower than the RTX 3080, so not a huge margin, and again, you're unlikely to ever notice this sort of a difference. But this is also more evidence that the RTX 3080 is a little better suited to 4K gaming. Doom Eternal sees the 6800 XT pumping out over 300 FPS at 1440p to deliver RTX 3080 light performance, and that meant it was 72% faster than the 5700 XT and Radeon 7 GPUs. And that massive 16GB VRAM buffer comes in handy at 4K with the Ultra Nightmare texture quality as it allowed the 6800 XT to beat the 5700 XT by a whopping 127% margin. Performance relative to the high-end Ampere GPUs was also very good as the 6800 XT trailed the 3080 by just a 7% margin. The second last game we're going to look at is Wolfenstein Youngblood, and at 1440p we're seeing 241 FPS from the 6800 XT, making it just 4% slower than the RTX 3080. Incredibly, this is yet another title where we're seeing over a 90% performance uplift from the 5700 XT. And the 6800 XT is just as impressive at 4K, despite losing ground to the RTX 3080, which as we've seen time and time again now, typically comes alive at this high resolution as it's able to better load up all of those cores. Still, the 6800 XT was just 9% slower and with 137 FPS on average performance was still quite impressive. The last game tested is Hitman 2 and like Metro Exodus, we are running into a CPU bottleneck at 1440p with the 3950X. The 4K data though isn't limited by the CPU, and here the 6800 XT was seen to be 8% slower than the RTX 3080, which is a fairly typical margin at this resolution. Speaking of typical margins, here's a look at the average performance seen across the 18 games tested. Although we didn't spend time looking at the 1080p data in this review, I did collect it, and those graphs will be made available to Patreon and Floatplane members. But to save time though, here's a look at the 1080p average data, and as you can see, at this lower resolution, the 6800 XT fares very well, just edging out the RTX 3090 to beat the 3080 by a 6% margin. So fairly similar performance across those three GPUs. Now, at 1440p, the 6800 XT slips behind the 3090 by a 5% margin, but it is still just ahead of the RTX 3080 by a 3% margin. So in other words, performance is much the same, as anything within a 5% margin I typically deem to be a tie. When compared to the 5700 XT, we're looking at a 67% performance increase on average, which is good, but not amazing given it costs a little over 60% more. Then at 4K, as we often saw, the RTX 3080 fares a little bit better here. Overall though, the 6800 XT was just 5% slower, and the margin to the 5700 XT opens up quite a lot. Here the new RDNA 2 GPU was 86% faster, and that's obviously quite a substantial performance uplift, even when taking the price into account. Speaking of the price, here's a look at the cost per frame, and I'll start by using the 1080p data. When compared to the RTX 3080, the 6800 XT costs 12% less per frame, while it comes in at an 8% premium over the RTX 3070. Though it is worth noting that that cost analysis doesn't account for the fact that the Radeon GPU packs twice as much VRAM. We're also seeing a similar price premium over the 5700 XT, but again, twice as much VRAM and a higher performance tier. The cost per frame for the 6800 XT relative to parts such as the 5700 XT does improve at 1440p, and it does so for two reasons. It's really a double whammy, as the higher resolution means we're seeing fewer CPU limited scenarios, with more chance of loading up all of those cores on these higher end GPUs. As a result, the 6800 XT is now one of the best value GPUs on the market, alongside the RTX 3070. It comes in costing 9% less per frame when compared to the RTX 3080, and is a substantial improvement over similarly priced previous generation products such as the RTX 2080 Super. Then at 4K, we're seeing similar performance and value from the 6800 XT and RTX 3080. They're very much neck and neck here, so you wouldn't necessarily pick one over the other based on price or performance. Features that may sway you one way or the other include stuff like ray tracing performance, though personally I care very little for ray tracing support right now as there are almost no games where I feel it's worth enabling. That being the case for this review, I haven't invested too much time in testing ray tracing performance, and perhaps this is something we'll explore more in future content. 
In the meantime, here's how they compare in Shadow of the Tomb Raider, one of the first RTX titles to receive ray tracing support. So it comes as a little surprise to learn that the GeForce RTX graphics cards perform much better here. Though I would note that the almost 40% hit to performance with the RTX 3080 seen at 1440p is completely unacceptable for slightly better shadows. The 6800 XT fares even worse, dropping almost 50% of its original performance. Again, not particularly surprising to see RDNA 2 making out more poorly in an NVIDIA RTX sponsored title. Another game with pointless ray traced shadow effects is Dirt 5, though here we are only seeing a 20% hit to performance, and I say only as I'm comparing it to the performance hits we see in other titles supporting ray traced effects. The performance hit here is similar for all three GPUs tested, the 6800 XT is just starting from much further ahead. At this point I'm not really sure what to make of the 6800 XT's ray tracing performance, I imagine I'll end up being just as underwhelmed as I was by the GeForce experience. A new feature that I find far more exciting than ray tracing, at least in the short term, is Smart Access Memory or SAM. What AMD is doing here is taking advantage of a PCI Express feature called Base Address Register, which defines how much of your graphics card's VRAM can be mapped. Typically systems are limited to 256 megabytes of mapped VRAM, but with RDNA 2 and the new Ryzen 5000 series of processors, AMD has enabled this feature, giving the CPU full access to the graphics card's VRAM buffer. Now before we get in the data, I should note that this feature doesn't improve performance in all games, and the margins will vary depending on the title. Nvidia has also recently come out and said that they will be enabling SAM with a new driver soon, and they've got it working on both AMD and Intel platforms in their labs. Anyway, I'll talk more about this feature later in the video. For now, let's take a look at performance using the Ryzen 9 5950X. Starting with Assassin's Creed Valhalla, we're seeing some pretty incredible things with SAM enabled. At 1080p, we're looking at a 17% performance boost in this title. That's a remarkable uplift, and it means the 6800 XT is now 53% faster than the RTX 3080 at this resolution. At 1440p, we're still looking at a strong performance uplift. This time, the frame rate is improved by 14%, and that meant the 6800 XT was 40% faster than the RTX 3080. 40% faster at 1440p, that is pretty crazy. We're also looking at a 15% performance improvement at 4K, and that means whereas the 6800 XT was able to roughly match the RTX 3080 previously, with SAM enabled, it's now 13% faster. However, it is worth noting that the effects of SAM are less significant in Rainbow Six Siege, but we're still getting a further 5% performance at 1080p, and that further widened the gap to the RTX 3080. The margin was reduced to 4% at 1440p, but again that's an extra 4% performance for nothing, and then we're seeing just a 2% boost at 4k. The gains in Shadow of the Tomb Raider are similar to those seen in Rainbow Six Siege, at 1080p we're looking at a 6% boost, though that was enough to pull the 6800 XT ahead of the RTX 3080. Then we see a 6% boost at 1440p, and just 3% at 4k, so again, not amazing gains in this title, but it is still extra performance at no real cost. Now, whereas the RTX 3080 features a total board power rating of 320 watts, the 6800 XT is a slightly more conservative 300 watts. When comparing the AMD reference model to Nvidia's Founders Edition version, we're seeing a 40 watt reduction in total system usage going in AMD's favour. So, while the 6800 XT is still a very power hungry GPU, it appears to be far more power efficient than past AMD GPUs such as the 5700 XT. Using Nvidia's PCAT, we see that the 6800 XT consumes around 9% less power than the RTX 3080, which depending on the resolution will give it a similar performance per watt rating. It's also interesting to note that while the 6800 XT consumed 19% more power than the 5700 XT, it was often well over 50% faster, so an impressive improvement there for power efficiency. And here we see in terms of performance per watt, the 6800 XT is just over a 50% improvement when compared to the 5700 XT and a slight improvement over the RTX 3080. So as we found with the Ampere GPUs, despite being very power hungry, the performance is strong enough that they come out looking very good in terms of performance per watt. Another area where AMD has improved massively is with their reference design. This is something we've basically been begging them to sort out for about a decade now. Unlike previous Dustbuster designs, the 6800 XT reference card is cool and quiet. After an hour and shut off the Tomb Raider at 4K, the card peaked at just 75 degrees with a fan speed of just 1600 RPM, and that is seriously good performance that sees AMD set the bar very high for their partners, 
But given the card isn't some gigantic, massive RTX 3090 Founders Edition, I feel they should be able to rise to the occasion. Just quickly, let's talk about overclocking. By default, the reference card operated at 2200 MHz in Shadow of the Tomb Raider after an hour. With the frequency increased to 2500 MHz in the Wattman software, the clock speed in game was increased to 2365 MHz on average, so a 7.5% frequency increase, which generally netted me about a 5% FPS boost in games. So, pretty uneventful, really. Hopefully, AIB models will have higher power limits for more OC headroom. Okay, so that is the Radeon RX 6800 XT. Seems pretty good to me. Performance is obviously excellent, and it's quite shocking to think that just two months ago now, the RTX 3080 completely blew us away with its performance. So that being the case, I wasn't, I have to admit, I wasn't overly confident AMD could pull this one off. But for the first time in a long time, they've caught NVIDIA and are genuinely offering a better value product, depending on your preferences. As expected, depending on the game and even the quality settings used, the 6800 XT and RTX 3080 trade blows, so it's very difficult to pick a clear winner. They're both so evenly matched. The main advantage, though, of the GeForce GPU as I see it is the more mature ray tracing support, and of course DLSS 2.0, though both are questionable features, and in our opinion, aren't major selling points unless you play a specific selection of games. Basically, what I mean by that is the game support list is just too limited. DLSS 2.0 is amazing, it's just not in enough games. There are even less games where you can really enjoy ray traced effects. The best AAA implementations that we've seen so far, at least in our opinion, uh, is Watch Dogs Legion and Control. Though again, the performance hit is massive, but at least you can notice the effects in those titles. The advantage of the 6800 XT includes a much larger VRAM buffer, SAM support, and a slight price decrease. The 16GB VRAM buffer is almost certainly going to prove beneficial down the track. Think just one to two years. Support for SAM is another big one, though right now it is limited to those using a Ryzen 5000 series processor on a 500 series motherboard. This might also end up being a limited time only exclusive for AMD if NVIDIA are to be believed, and I don't doubt that the green team is madly scrambling to get this one working with AMP GPUs, and that's a good thing as it will force AMD to open up support to all users. On that note, I should make mention that PCI Express 4.0 doesn't appear to be a requirement for SAM either. I ran a few quick tests in Assassin's Creed Valhalla while forcing PCIe 3.0 on our X570 motherboard, and I didn't see a decline in performance when compared to PCIe 4.0, so that was interesting. The testing at this point is very limited, so it is something we will need to explore further with a little more time up our sleeves. Also, again, I should note that the performance gains offered by SAM vary quite a lot depending on the game, and in some titles, there's no gains to be seen at all. And this was the case in titles such as Horizon Zero Dawn and Watch Dogs, for example, but I haven't tested all 18 games yet, again, just due to time. Moving on, it was great to see AMD finally nail the reference design. It's a genuinely good product now, and I'd have no issue using this in my own PC. That said, this time next week, board partners will be launching their own custom models. Therefore, I'd personally wait and see what's on offer there. Chances are you'll be able to buy an even cooler and quieter model with higher power limits for overclocking. As for availability, all indicators point to horrid stock levels for this initial wave of reference models. The release date for custom cards is the 25th, so a week from now, and while I'm hearing stock levels are better for those models, there's no way they're not going to sell out in seconds. I'd suggest you expect availability pain until at least December, and that's just par for the course with these popular GPU releases. I'd also expect AMD to be on top of the demand within two months though. And if not, it'll be another Ampere-like disaster. Basically, AMD's been given a rare opportunity here to steal away NVIDIA customers who have been desperate for RTX 3080 performance for months now. Uh, they've likely only got a narrow window though to pounce, so it will be interesting to see if they squander that opportunity. And there's almost no chance those who sold their RTX 2080 Ti's in anticipation of the 3080, and they've just been left there hitting refresh, hoping to hoping to be able to buy one, that they're not going to just snap up a 6800 XT faster than you can say just buy it. Of course, that is assuming good availability of the 6800 XT. And there's really no reason not to buy the 6800 XT over the RTX 3080 should both of them be available. In many ways, the Radeon GPU is the superior product. And that being the case, it is crazy to think how far ahead NVIDIA were with products such as Pascal 
only to squander that lead in what seems like a, well, a very Intel-like way, let's say. And now that AMD is well and truly caught up, you can expect the GPU wars to get very interesting. And that's gonna do it for my first look at the Radeon RX 6800 XT. Tomorrow I will have a detailed 6800 review, and then on the 25th we can start reviewing board partner cards. And then early next month, of course, we will have the 6900 XT. So plenty more to come, make sure you're subscribed. And again, if you enjoyed this video, you know what to do. Much appreciated for all our hard work. Also, you can join us over on Floatplane or Patreon if you'd like to become part of the Harbour Unbox community. There are a few cool perks there, such as our exclusive Discord chat. Tim and myself are active on that. We also do a monthly live stream for our Patreon members, Q&As, behind the scenes videos, a lot of cool stuff there. If you're interested, links for that stuff is in the video description. If you're not perfectly fine, and I would like to just thank you for watching this video. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.